On October 12, 1972, a Fairchild aircraft of the Uruguayan Air Force took off from the old Carrasco Airport in Montevideo, bound for Santiago, Chile. On board were members of the rugby team, all Christians, accompanied by friends and family, sharing laughter and jokes. When they boarded, no one could imagine that this group would become the protagonists of one of the most spectacular survival stories of the entire 20th century. The plane took off from Uruguay towards the Chilean capital, but adverse weather conditions forced the pilots to make a stop in the Argentine city of Mendoza, very close to the Andes Mountains. On October 13th, the plane took off again towards Santiago because the Fairchild couldn't fly at too high an altitude. The pilots charted a route in the shape of a U through the Planchon Pass. Facing this pass, the plane encountered a large mass of clouds. The pilots entered them, traveling blindly for a few minutes. They also alerted the flight attendant to instruct passengers to fasten their seatbelts. Carlitos Paez, one of the survivors, recalls the flight attendant's command. Fasten your seatbelts because the plane is going to dance for a while. The atmosphere on the plane was mostly youthful, and many were leaving their country for the first time. Jokes were constant up to that moment. In fact, almost no one paid much attention to the flight attendant. It took several more turbulence episodes for them to start taking it seriously. The pilot's big mistake was that, while flying blind, they thought they had already reached the city of Curicó, the last point of the Planchon Pass. In reality, when the plane decided to turn north, it was still in the middle of the pass, so it re-entered the Andes. After the clouds cleared, the pilot faced an unexpected panorama surrounded by the imposing mountains of the Andes. By that time, the atmosphere inside the plane had changed completely. They saw the mountains too close to the aircraft and the turbulence became increasingly strong. Suddenly, the pilot found a mountain right in front. He tried to maneuver by raising the plane as much as possible and forcing the engines to the maximum. Another survivor named Gustavo Zervino recalls that moment. The plane was shaking a lot. It seemed like it was going to burst. The plane's belly collided, breaking it from the tail and losing both wings. The rest of the fuselage landed in a valley, sliding down uncontrollably like a sled. Roberto Canessa remembers that, at those moments, doubt struck him. What comes after death? Does God exist? Carlos Paez prayed an Ave Maria. To the surprise of many, the fuselage didn't crash during the descent, but came to a sudden stop when it hit a snowbank, causing all the seats to move towards the front. Of the 45 people on board, 13 died in the accident, and many were injured, including Nando Parado, who was left in a coma by a blow to the head during the accident. After the initial shock moments, during which many thought it was just a nightmare, medical students Roberto Canessa, Gustavo Zervino, and Diego Storm quickly became the accident's doctors, attending to the injured and checking the health of the survivors. Other survivors exited through the hole left by the broken fuselage and went to the front of the plane to check the crew's condition, finding the pilot dead and the co-pilot in agony. The co-pilot had not yet realized his mistake and informed the rest that they had passed Curaco, then begged Mancho Sabella, another survivor, to grab his gun and end his agony, something that did not happen. Amidst all that chaos, the figure of a leader emerged, essential in great challenges. In this case, Marcelo Perez, the team captain, a 25-year-old youth. Along with other teammates, he immediately began to organize to the best of their ability amidst the disaster. Given the weather conditions, he realized they had to spend the night there, so they started turning that fuselage into an improvised shelter. They quickly realized the first problem they would face the cold. The place where the plane crashed is known as the Valley of Tears, and due to temperatures, it resembles a gigantic freezer, reaching nighttime temperatures between minus 40 to minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. Each and every survivor agrees in describing that night as the most terrible they had lived up to that point. Cold, cries of agony, or sleeping next to friends who until a few hours ago were chatting with you and now lay lifeless. 
As a relief, they decided to cover the hole with suitcases and fuselage remnants, which didn't prevent them from feeling the cold, but thanks to this, they wouldn't die frozen during the night. However, it couldn't be avoided that on that first night, four lives were extinguished. The next morning, the captain took charge of leading the operations. They removed the bodies of the deceased from the fuselage and left them in the snow. They counted the remaining food and rationed it. A few chocolate tablets, two bottles of wine, two cans of preserves, and some candy. All of this to be distributed among the 28 survivors. That day, Nando Parado, whom some had considered dead, began to show signs of life. They also saw the first planes flying over the area, filling them with joy, thinking they would soon be rescued. But the reality is that the planes never saw them. On the fourth day after the accident, Nando Parado woke up from a coma, and they informed him that his mother, who was traveling with him, had died, and his sister Susana was badly injured. Given his sister's situation, there was little they could do as she suffered internal bleeding. Still, Nando did not leave her side until she passed away a few days later. Days passed, hunger tightened, but these people wanted to live. A kind of micro-society was formed to maintain order, make collective decisions, assign tasks, and keep morale, all while trying to deal with pain, loss, and extreme adverse conditions. This micro-society was called the Society of the Snow. One problem they faced was the lack of water. They couldn't be ingesting snow permanently. To solve this, Adolfo Strouch ingeniously obtained water using aluminum sheets from the plane seats and putting snow on them to melt. Some began to make the first expeditions around, but they soon realized that with a glass of wine and an ounce of chocolate, they wouldn't get very far, especially in such a hostile environment. Hunger weakened them rapidly. That's when the idea of feeding on the deceased began to occupy everyone's minds. Day 10 after the accident marked a turning point. They found a small radio that Roy Harley built an antenna for to listen to the news about them. With that radio, they heard that the rescue tasks were considered finished, meaning they were declared dead. This mentally devastated them, especially Marcelo Perez, who always insisted they would be rescued. It was at that moment when the idea of cannibalism, which until then had only been an idea, became their only survival alternative. In those days, the group made a pact. Anyone who dies will feed the others. It's hard to imagine everything that went through their minds when ingesting human flesh, but on a physical level, they observed that their bodies responded well and their chances of survival increased. Gradually, everyone ended up doing it. From that moment, expeditions were planned with a clear goal, to find the tail of the plane, where the radio's batteries were located, and thus be able to communicate with the outside. Spirits began to decline day by day, but the worst was yet to come, and it did. On the night of October 29th, while they were sleeping, a catastrophic event occurred. An avalanche forcefully entered the fuselage, burying everyone under the snow. Only Roy Harley managed to escape the avalanche due to too many problems, so he quickly began to unearth his companions. When one surfaced, they helped the others. Many managed to be unearthed in time, but despite great efforts, eight of them lost their lives, including Marcelo, the team captain, and Liliana Methal, the only woman left alive. The plane was buried for several days, and there they had to push survival to the limit by feeding on the comrades who died in the avalanche. Paradoxically, being under the snow caused the temperature inside the fuselage to rise considerably, and they could rest a little better. When they could finally go outside, they realized they had to escape from those mountains at all costs. They began to form a definitive team of expeditionaries. The first one was Nando Parado, who didn't want to face the decision to feed on his mother and sister. Another was Roberto Canessa, one of the strongest. Antonio Vincentin would also join. They headed east, trying to find a pass through the mountains, and they found the tail of the plane. There were the batteries, and there was also some food. They moved the plane's radio there, as the batteries were too heavy. However, to Roy Harley's disappointment, who had some knowledge of electronics, 
he couldn't get it to work. But not everything was bad news on that expedition, as Antonio Vinzintin discovered a material in the tail that was used as insulation for the plane. Roberto Canessa saw it and discovered that it was not only a perfect insulation material, but also insulated completely from the cold. They decided to take it to the fuselage to sew a sleeping bag that would help them endure the icy nights of the Andes. They had already lost two other companions, Arturo Nogueira and Rafael Echevarin. Snow had no compassion. They had to prepare for the final expedition. That expedition wouldn't leave until the weather improved to have a better chance of success. With the approach of summer, they would take the sleeping bag they were sewing. When that sleeping bag was completed, Numa Turkati, who weighed less than 65 pounds, died. For the final expedition, once again, the chosen ones were Nando Parado, Roberto Canessa, and Antonio Vicentin. Remember, they still didn't know exactly where they were. They believed, based on the co-pilot's information, that they were near Curaco. So this time, they marched west. For them, salvation was there although they had to cross a mountain over 14500 feet, blocking their path. Thus, on December 12th, after 61 days, the life-or-death expedition set off. They began by climbing the great mountain. Reaching the summit took them three days. Nando was the first to reach the top, and when he saw what was on the other side, he completely collapsed. He expected to see green valleys in the distance, but instead he encountered an endless expanse of snowy mountains. Canessa, who suffered the same disappointment, was the next to arrive. After a few minutes of anguish, Nando told Roberto that they couldn't go back. If we return to the plane, we are dead, and if I die, I will die trying. Roberto, after reflecting for a few minutes, decided to accompany him. Vizentin, who wasn't in great shape, was sent back to report what had happened. After receiving the food ration from his companion, Nando and Roberto resumed their westward journey. The journey was no walk in the park, as according to Nando Parado, they faced every obstacle you could encounter in a mountain range. On the eighth day of their march, leaving the fuselage, Nando and Roberto began to notice that the snow was retreating, giving way to the earth and plants. In those days, they found a small river and began to follow its course, seeing evident signs of civilization along the way, such as cut branches, garbage, and a distant cow. On the ninth day, the miracle happened. The wanderers, without direction, encountered a man on horseback on the other side of the river. Nando ran down to the shore, but to his misfortune, the width of the river and the sound of the water prevented communication. Nando only heard the word, Tomorrow. They had to go to sleep and wait. The next morning they saw three men by a campfire in the distance. They looked like farmers. One of them threw a stone to the other side of the river to which he had attached a paper and a pencil. When Nando picked up the stone, he wrote the note that would save their lives. I come from a plane that crashed in the mountains. I am Uruguayan. We have been walking for ten days. I have a wounded friend up there. In the plain, there are fourteen injured people. We have to get out of here quickly, and we don't know how. We have no food. We are weak. When will they come to find us up there? Please, we can't even walk. Where are we? Nando threw the message back to the other side. When the farmer read it, in disbelief, he made a gesture telling them to wait there, went to get help. Before leaving, another man approached and handed Nando and Roberto some bread and cheese. Excluding the human flesh and something edible they found in the tail, it was practically the first meal they had tasted in two months. They were in a town called Los Maitenes. Nando and Roberto learned that a muleteer named Sergio Catalan, whom they had seen on horseback the night before, had embarked on a several-hour journey to the nearest police post. Later, the cabin where they had been taken for shelter and food would be filled with police and press. The news shocked the media. It was impossible. No one expected that there could be any survivors from that plane that crashed over two months ago. Well, no one except Carlitos Paez's father, who never stopped believing that his son was alive. But the remaining fourteen survivors were missing. To find them, 
the rescue teams asked the two survivors, and not getting clarity from the map, they asked Nando to get on the helicopter to guide them. Probably the last thing he wanted to do was get back on a flying device, but the lives of his companions were more important. The survivors, who were next to the plane's fuselage, had already heard the news on the radio. Canessa and Parado had appeared. They had succeeded. Despite the misfortune suffered for so many days, they were ecstatic with happiness when they finally saw the long-awaited helicopters.